Hare Krishna. Welcome back to the narration of those 18 days, the Kurukshetra war and the dr dramatic incidents and the life lessons thereof. On the 13th day, one of the biggest acts of heroism and despotism and tragedy happened. Yudhishthir was the target of Dronacharya and two successive days he had been baffled by Arjuna's intervention. So on the 13th day Dronacharya made a plan to use the chakra viewer and only Arjuna knew how to break that formidable of military formation. So chakra viewer literally means a viewer, a military formation that is like a circle. So there are multiple layers and multiple blockages so that it is almost impenetrable. And as the formation moves forward, 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 it can just destroy the opposing army. And if anybody can break into it, they can be very, very terribly trapped inside it. So Arjuna was sidetracked by the challenge of the Samchapatakas headed by Susharma along with the Trigartas and thus there was no one who could break into the Chakravyu. Seeing that military formation Yudhishthir became thoughtful. Arjuna had been taken quite a far distance away. And thus, and he was busy fighting with a large number of forces. So therefore, Abhimanyu decided, uh, it was decided that they needed an alternative to be able to stop. And the only person who could stop was Abhimanyu. So how would Abhimanyu be able to stop? Because he knew. He knew how to enter the Chakravyu. Long ago when Arjuna was explaining military formations to Subhadra, Abhimanyu had heard it. Some traditions say that it is that while he was in her womb he heard it and then she nodded off and Arjuna stopped speaking. Uh, but the point was that he had heard only how to go inside. He did not know how to come out. So when he was called by Yudhishthir, and he said, you know, today our entire army will be destroyed and Drona will fulfill his vow to have me arrested. If you can break into the chakra view, then our army can be saved today. Abhimanyu looked hesitant. He said, I know of course how to go in, but I do not know how to go, come out. I will be trapped inside. So Yudhishthir said, we will follow you right behind. I <clears throat> and many other warriors, Drishtadyumna and Nakula, Sahadev, we will all follow, we will be right behind you. You just break the chakra view, we will all come inside and from inside we will destroy this military formation. And Bhima was nearby, Bhima also heard and he said, I will be with you. Bhimanyu looked at the expectant faces of all his venerable uncles and other elders and he said it is my duty and my honor and my pleasure to be of service to you today i will exhibit a fight that has never been seen in the history of the world now these are ways in which kshatriyas evoke their own martial spirits when they are fighting and drona was at the head of the military formation and Abhimanyu charged toward it. There was a fierce but brief fight as showers of arrows were being sh shot. Abhimanyu was just waiting for the opportunity and the vulnerability. After while he was fighting with Drona, he was observing the military formation and where he noticed vulnerability, next moment while fighting with Drona, he shifted his arrows and hurled dozens of arrows at that weak point and suddenly he 
also shot several arrows at Drona with rapid speed and stunned Drona. And with a quick fainting movement, he charged into the point where he had made a breach. And such was his ferocity of the attack that the breach we had, he had created by his early attack broke under his further attack. And he raced into the chakra. Drona was stunned, but he saw that Abhimanyu had already entered. As the Pandavas followed, and there was chaos in the Kaurava camp, because this was an unstoppable military formation. And they had expected victory. They had not expected it to be broken and broken so easily. And that too by a 16-year-old lad. While there was chaos, the Pandavas took that opportunity to race right in. But suddenly, a horrifyingly unexpected thing happened. Jayadrat suddenly came in between. Now he was not ordinarily no match to the Pandavas. Even one of them, what to speak of, four of them. And yet, he single-handedly held all of them back. The Pandavas along with Drishtudyumna and other Pandava warriors were all held back by Jayadrat. And seeing this stunning feat, the Kaurava warriors who had been broken apart by Abhimanyu's penetration cheered and gathered their morale and gathered themselves again in the military formation. The Pandavas fought fiercely, desperately, but in front of their terrified eyes, they saw the breach close and their beloved 16-year-old nephew was trapped inside the chakra view. Meanwhile, Abhimanyu had rushed right into the middle of the enemy camp, enemy forces, and he was fighting furiously. He soon noticed that there was no one following him. But here was his opportunity for glory. Here was the necessity for him to fight at his best. And fight he did. None of the Kaurav warriors could stand against him. He was like the commander of the gods, Skanda, destroying the Asuras. The Kaurav army was devastated. It seemed as if it would be decimated. Alarmed and enraged, Duryodhan charged towards uh, Abhimanyu. And as Abhimanyu and Duryodhan fought with each other, Duryodhan's anger was no match to Abhimanyu's skill. And as Duryodhan started getting wounded again and again, his pride would not allow him to retreat. But Abhimanyu's prowess would not allow him to stay. Seeing his predicament, several other Kaurav warriors came to assist him. As others challenged Abhimanyu, Abhimanyu broke through all of them, either destroying them or scattering them and continuing on his relentless attack. Karna challenged Abhimanyu. As Karna fought with Abhimanyu, he sensed that Abhimanyu seemed in every way to be equal to Arjuna. He couldn't find any weaknesses in Abhimanyu's defenses. And such was Abhimanyu's fierce fighting that Karna was severely wounded by a sudden and sharp uh, set of arrows that Arjuna, uh, Arjuna's son shot at him. And Karna fell back wounded. Seeing this, Drona charged towards Abhimanyu. But Abhimanyu repulsed even the great teacher who was the teacher of his own father. Then Ashwatthama charged towards Abhimanyu. Abhimanyu knocked him down and he fell back. Karana came forward again and again Arjuna's son defeated Arjuna's arch rival. Dushasan, seeing all the Kaurava warriors perplexed, came forward to attack. Dushasan often had more heroism than skills. Yes, he had skills. He was a great warrior, but he often overestimated his abilities. And there would be, a, whenever he would charge out of impulse into a fight, for a brief while, he would be able to hold his own against formidable Pandava warriors, whether it be Arjuna or whether it be others, whether it be Bhima. But after some time, he would be overcome. And he would 
fall back. The same thing happened here. Every single one of the Kaurava warriors, the prominent generals were all stunned and overpowered by Abhimanyu. At that time, a powerful Kaurava ally, Ashimaka, challenged Abhimanyu and they fought fiercely. Although Ashimaka was a great hero and he had enormous skill, still this seemed to be Abhimanyu's day. Nobody could, what to speak of, defeat him, even detect any weakness in him. And right before the astounded and alarmed eyes of the Kaurava warriors, Abhimanyu slew Ashimaka. Then uh, Karana, when second time he had been, he had been overpowered, one of Karana's brothers, another son of Adiratha, uh, had charged towards Abhimanyu. And although Abhimanyu bore no malice towards anyone, seeing this warrior attack him fiercely, Abhimanyu shot and killed him. Karana was incensed while he was watching. Shalya's, Shalya attacked. Shalya was a very powerful warrior, but Abhimanyu stunned him, wounded him, and he fell back. Seeing his discomfiture, Shalya's brother Madra came forward to attack Abhimanyu. And Abhimanyu fought with such ferocity that within a short while, Madra met his end. The Kauravas were at their wit's end. The day which was supposed to be their victory seemed to be the, have turned into a nightmare. The military formation, which was supposed to be the key to their dominating their opponents, had now become the cause of their opponent decimating them. Shakuni, uh, the Kaurava warriors, assembled with great alarm. Shakuni said, There is no way. We can kill him by fair means. We have to use hook or crook. Drona, Drona watched Abhimanyu fighting with admiration, open admiration. He said, Oh warriors, do you see any weaknesses in his defenses? How do you think we can defeat him? I see that he is equal to Arjuna in every way. And none of us will be able to defeat him. Duryodhana was still seething at his being defeated by the 16-year-old boy and all his generals being defeated by them and his entire army being destroyed. Still he somehow smiled somewhat sarcastically and he said, O oh, preceptor, it is your partiality towards the Pandavas because of which you are exulting at his defeating our army. You are our commander. He at one level wanted to go to Drona, but he was also afraid. He might have gone too far and Drona might get so angry that he might not fight at all. So immediately he changed his tone and he said, Oh grandsire, oh, oh, oh Acharya, we are all at your mercy. Please guide us how we can defeat him. Karna also said, Yes, I too have seen and seen his valor, I have felt the sting of his arrows. It's only because of my Kshatriya duty that I still stay on this battlefield after having been bested by him twice. O Acharya, you will surely know how we can defeat him. Drona looked down and he suggested something. He said, none of us will be able to defeat him alone. Hear carefully, O oh, Karana, what you need to do. There was tension always between Karana and Drona because Karana felt he had been unfairly refused education by Drona in his academy. But here that same Karana was asking Drona for help. And Drona felt that as, his, as he was the commander of the army, he had a duty to protect that army. He said, O oh, Karana, if you attack Abhimanyu and destroy his bow, the reins of his chariot and his chariot wheels. And at the same time, Ashwatthama, you destroy his charioteer. And you, Krutak Barma, you kill his horses. 
and if at the same time um, drona i'm i myself along with krutavarman and the king you durudana if we attack him together we might be able to take him down all the kaurava warriors knew this was horrendously unfair but they saw no alternative and their plan went as per what they had envisioned and soon abhimanyu was left weaponless charioteless charioteerless horseless still remaining fearless abhimanyu took up a sword and fought from his chariot his sword was broken within moments uh, he picked up he picked up another sword and he picked up a mace and leapt off his motionless chariot and started charging towards the kauravas but they all shot arrows towards him he whirled round and round and round to to whisk away all the arrows that were surging towards him but the attack was too much using his mystic powers he rose into the sky and from there he started swinging his sword in various ways exhibiting astonishing movements as he countered the weapons coming toward him looking up at abhimanyu drona took carefully and while abhimanyu was trying to parry other arrows with his sword drona cut off his sword simultaneously karna to cut off his shield defenseless abhimanyu came down and looked around in nearby saw a wheel remembering how krishna had used a wheel to charge toward bhishma he took that wheel and he charged toward drona as he was charging with absolutely no trepidation it was the kaurava warriors who were uh, who were stunned to see his unf- unflinching heroism but they all shot arrows simultaneously at him and his wheel he broken enraged at this uh, unfair and brutal assault ashwatthama looked around and he saw a mace he picked up that mace and he saw nearby ashwatthama's chariot he raced toward ashwatthama's chariot and leapt into the air to smash that mace right on that chariot such was the force that which he was following with that ashwatthama realized he could not counter it ashwatthama just leapt off his chariot and the entire chariot along with the charioteer and the horses were crushed by the force of abhimanyu's blow and abhimanyu using that may turned around started whirling it around destroying whoever came in his way shakuni's brother kalikeya tried to attack abhimanyu and abhimanyu destroyed him though he was in a very vulnerable situation yet he fought with such force and ferocity that he destroyed whoever approached him bhai dushasan's son durjay on a big powerful chariot charged towards abhimanyu abhimanyu using his mace raced toward the chariot and brought that mace smashing down on Durjay's chariot, the same we had, the same way he had done for Ashwatthama. Durjay leapt off the chariot in the nick of time, grabbing a mace, and then he turned around and challenged Abhimanyu. They both fought fiercely. Now, uh, normally Abhimanyu would have easily defeated Durjay, but here he was tired. His reflexes were slow. Still, he held up against Durjay's attacks. but as both of them were dodging blows both of them made a sudden motion and both of them hit each other and both of them went down after a few moments both of them got up durjay got up sprang up and picked up his mace abhimanyu too got up but having fought for so long against so many warriors he was tired he was slow in getting up and before he could use his mace to defend himself durjay brought his mace smashing down upon abhimanyu's skull his skull broke apart and that great warrior fell dead as the kaurava warriors gathered around him 
they saw that although there was a brutal wound on his skull, but still his face remained serene. It was like a fully blossoming lotus in, in autumn. The Kaurav warriors cheered, jubilant, at having defeated the enemy who they, who they had found was undefeatable. As their shouts of celebration reverberated across the battlefield, they reached the Pandavas. From the moment they had seen the Chakraviva close, they had been waiting in agony. They tried again and again to break the Chakraviva, but it was impossible. Yudhishthira especially felt extremely remorseful, extremely guilty. And then he sensed that Abhimanyu had been killed. And when the news was confirmed, he sank into his chariot in utter angst. What had he done for the sake of his own life? He had sent a 16-year-old boy to death. Looking around, he saw his brothers and other warriors distraught. Remembering his duty as a king, he tried to pull himself together and he tried to console them. Abhimanyu had fearlessly fought like never before and he has surely attained a hero's end. He will attain auspicious abode in the next life. We didn't lament for him. Although he tried to console him, he couldn't prevent his grief from overwhelming him. He said, he spoke out more to himself than to others, although those others around him could hear him. He said, alas, that 16-year-old boy deserved all care, protection and comfort from me. And yet, for my own safety, I send him to his death. How selfish I am. For my own interest, I offered as a sacrificial lamb the son of Arjuna. Indeed, when he comes, what will I speak to him? How will I give this terribly inauspicious news to that auspicious lady, Subhadra? Her name was Subhadra, but he had to give her an abhadra news, an auspicious news. I am a criminal. To all of them, to Arjuna, to <coughs> Subhadra and to Krishna, who was the uncle of Abhimanyu. In the meanwhile, the sun had sunk, the day's war ended and the Pandavas went back to their tent in utter dejection. As Yudhishthir was lamenting again and again, and nobody could console him. All the, the Pandavas, the other Pandavas themselves were distraught. But even all the Pandava warriors were distraught. Because of his cheerful and lively disposition and his heroism, Abhimanyu had become a favorite among all the Kaurava warriors. And they all lamented his death. As Yudhishthira was lamenting, sitting in his tent, suddenly, at that time, Vyasadeva came over there. Seeing him, Yudhishthira got off his chariot, tried to pull himself, got off his seat, pulled himself together, offered him his obeisances and he said, O sage, we are all shattered because Subhadra's son has been killed. Vyasadeva looked at him gravely and he said, O king, men of superior wisdom like you, do not lament the death that is inevitable. Kings far greater than Abhimanyu, both greater in valor and, and virtue, have also met their death sooner or later. No living being in this world can violate the law of death. Yudhishthira said, seeing how many people have been killed in this war, we have realized the reality and the gravity of death. Why, O king, does death ex Why, O sage, does death exist? As Yudhishthira asked this question, he felt himself moving to a comfortable ground. He was always happy and comfortable discussing philosophy. 
now philosophy was not just a comfort but a shelter for him as his own guilt was afflicting him Vyas Dev's words provided him solace as he explained the origin of death in the misidentification of the immortal soul with the mortal body. As Vyas Dev continued his narration, Vishnu felt his his heart was still heavy, but the grip of grief on his heart weakened. And then, as Vyas Dev continued his narration, he said. O king, grief achieves nothing but to sap the energy of those who indulge in it. As uh, Yudhishthira pondered these words, he asked the question that was there on all the Pandavas' minds. How was Jaidrath able to stop all of us? He said Jaidrath had a vow from Lord Shiva that one day he would be able to stop all of you except Arjuna. And he used that vow today. The pan Bhima punched his fist in frustration. Although there was an explanation, but there was no release. Abhimanyu was still dead. He asked, they looked with kind eyes at all the Pandavas. And again, he fixed his eyes on Yudhishthir. And he said, O king, do not lament. The inscrutable will of the Lord is surely for the welfare of everyone. If you do his will, you will realize that in due course. Offering consoling and comforting words to Yudhishthir, along with words of profound wisdom, Yasudev got up to depart. Yudhishthir got up. His heart was somewhat lightened after hearing Yasudev's words, but still he dreaded the task of telling Arjuna what had happened. He knew none of the soldiers or warriors would tell him. It, that, that burden lay on him alone. Here we see that Yudhishthir, was he guilty? He was not. In one sense, he had sent Abhiman knew, but they had a plan. And in, as per that plan, they would have been able to not only protect Abhiman knew, but protect their entire army and defeat their enemies. Sometimes we make plan with the best of the in intentions and the best of the information that we have. But sometimes factors beyond our control, factors beyond our knowledge come into play and they thwart us. Now, the action that we start it may lead to a disaster, but we can't beat ourselves down with guilt because of what has happened, because of what is not our mistake. So, Yudhishthir was consoled by the words of Vyasadev. Guilt is a very disempowering, distressing, and even degrading emotion. By degrading because of guilt, especially guilt that is false. Guilt for some, having done something which we didn't intend to do, something which happened because of factors beyond our control. That guilt discourages us from doing the right thing and thus puts us into the clutches of illusion, of self-deception. And then what we can do right, right now, we don't even do that. So sometimes when we act in our life, there are terrible consequences that come. Probably we will never have to bear the kind of consequence that Yudhishthir had to bear. To have his nephew killed because of his decision. Not just his decision, his request. But he knew that, as we asked Dev's word, destiny was supreme. It was by destiny's will that Jayadrath was there at that time and Abhiman knew penetrated and he blocked. So knowing that if we did our best effort, whatever was possible for us in that situation, and despite that things go wrong, we don't have to blame ourselves for things that are beyond our control. If we blame ourselves, we disempower ourselves. And we disempower ourselves, then we can't do what is in our control. But if we take responsibility for ourselves, that means if it was our mistake, we acknowledge that it was not our, it was not our mistake, then we move on. Either way, the important thing is, of what can I do right, right now? That is the key question. Why things happen 
asking that question can be very disempowering. Sometimes it can give us some answers, but if that only leads to bafflement and discouragement, we put aside that question. And don't let guilt disempower us. Take responsibility, not for the wrongs of the past that were not in our control. Take responsibility for doing the right that is right now in our control. Thank you. Hare Krishna.